Oh, oh I beg your pardon. <laughs> Friends, welcome once again. Welcome to, to Al Monticello. Uh, and for today's particular subject, you, you've actually caught me uh, right in the process of entering into my farm book. And right here in the farm office uh, of Monticello. And, and that is the subject of our confab today, a discussion about um, uh, farming here at Monticello, the management uh, of Monticello, and my other farms. So I, I shall endeavor to place this here and, um, and to attend to you all uh, for our delightful conversation. Uh, before I begin, uh, may I ask two pleasantries of you. Firstly, in order that I might be heard more clearly, again, I'd not be presumptuous to do it otherwise. Will you allow me to remove my mask? Thank you very much. And then, uh, secondly, if I may be seated in your company. A gentleman would never seat himself in the company of ladies already seated unless uh, he asks for their approbation. Well, thank you, and what a pleasure once more to have Miss Alice Wagner with us to ask your questions. And uh, so, therefore, without a further comment from myself, let us embark upon confabulation. And Ms. Wagner, our first question. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. As the eldest son born in 1743 at your father's farm at Shadwell, how did you come into ownership of the land you now call Monticello? Well, very simply because I was the eldest son. You're absolutely right. I was the eldest son in a family of 10 children and I had three younger brothers. I had six sisters. But when I was born, we were still governed by the monarchy of Great Britain and, of course, uh, English common law. So uh, I would be the inheritor of my father's estate. Those were the laws of primogenitor and entail, primo first, genitor family, the first in the family. Now, of course, my father did not inherit these lands. He actually purchased uh, the Shadwell Farm, where I was born and grew up, let alone Monticello, and several other farms uh, in the area. And remember, too, that these, <laughs> these were only farms under the cultivation of the Englishmen who were arriving the farther west here in the frontier of colonial Virginia. Never let us forget that the Monacan people, the natives of this land, were here long before centuries, if not millennia, uh, before any European arrived. And, of course, my father did know uh, many of the Monacan peoples. And I remember Chief Ontosite. Uh, who visited nearby in particular. But my father was born back east. He, he was born several miles south of Richmond along the James River, and he married back east. My parents first settled on a, a farm in Chesterfield County known as Fine Creek. Uh, and after that, uh, they moved farther to the west. And of the very first holdings my father was able to acquire was Tufton Plantation. Uh, which I have inherited as well. And then he settled Shadwell Farm, and then he bought Lego Farm, and then he bought Pantops Farm, uh, and then there was Elk Kill that had originally been Randolph property that was later acquired. All of these lands, as originally uh, patented, were not by my father, but rather by several families, not only the Randolphs, uh, but also the, the Lewis family and the Merriweather family. So by the time I came into an inheritance, when I was only 14, is that not extraordinary? You see, that was the year that my father passed away, 1757, and he was only 49. Well, at 14 years of age, I was not of age to be able to either inherit or to manage. That did not occur until my majority, when I was 21 in 1764. So there we are, roundabout to the very beginning, uh, I inherited Monticello, my father's farm, where I chose to live rather than to continue to live at Shadwell. I inherited that in 1764, and I moved to the mountain here uh, the latter part of the 60s. I leveled the, the top off in 1768, began to build my little brick hermitage here, and, well, I was resident before I was married. Uh, when I married back in January of 72, that's when I brought my bride, and we began our family here. Uh, your next question. When you thought about the development of the Monticello plantation, what crops did you wish to grow? 
Well, of course, the crops that I inherited to cultivate were essentially tobacco. That was the cash crop in the settlement of the colony of Virginia. And the farther west you, you migrated, you were claiming virgin soil. And the reason for that migration more than anything else was because in cultivating tobacco, you kill the soil. I can't put it any other way. Uh, tobacco is, is a jealous plant. It saps the soil of all of its food. And, and so therefore, within about, uh, oh, I would reckon, uh, 15 years of consistent cultivation of tobacco in one field alone, you're done. And, and you need to search out uh, lumbering further acreage, uh, planting within the stumps of the trees already there. And uh, so you may have uh, revenue to come back to you uh, uh, with, um, with great prosperity within five, seven years. But then look, within another five, seven years, you begin to fall on the wane. Now, when I moved to Monticello, uh, and it had already been cultivated by my father, I sought about immediately to plant orchards, particularly apple orchards. And so the very first orchards, the very first apple trees that I planted uh, were the uh, Albemarle or Newtown Pippin and the Spitzenberg apples. So I would say that that was the very first cultivation of my own uh, particular interest. Your next question. Chester would like to know if you practice crop rotation. Oh, Chester, thank you. That is one of my great interests, crop rotation. Uh, I had been introduced to it uh, during my travels throughout France and also uh, through my travels up north uh, in Maryland and uh, the south of, the, of Pennsylvania. Uh, the Dutch farmers there practiced rotation. And yes, I consider it most necessary for maintaining, if you will, a healthy soil. So when I decided in the 1790s that I would uh, remove myself uh, further and further from the cultivation of tobacco and take on the cultivation of wheat. I then realized in cultivating wheat uh, that we could sustain, sustain the soil by cultivating wheat over a, well, a period of seven years in rotation. Uh, three years to cultivate wheat one year after the next, and then to allow for two years uh, the fields to replenish themselves, resuscitate. A planting red clover would help that to happen. And then before you plant wheat again, uh, take another year uh, to plant, say, um, potatoes uh, or corn. Uh, and then the week, year after that, uh, engage another crop uh, of interest, perhaps oats uh, or, or grains of sorts, and then start back again in that seven-year cycle uh, to cultivate wheat. So yes, I think rotation uh, in crop sowing and, uh, and in cultivation is necessary for the replenishment and the sustaining, if you will, of farmlands. Your next question. What systems do you use in dividing and managing your lands for the cultivation of particular crops? Well, I have endeavored to use a system that was long practiced, particularly by the Englishman, uh, of dividing, if you will, your farms. And when I say farms, remember, as I said earlier, Monticello is one of several farms that I own. You might refer to the others as quarter farms. I made mention earlier of Tufton. I made mention of Shadwell and Lego and Pantops, uh, Elk Hill, uh, of course. These, these are quarter farms so that the proper management of those quarter farms is then to divide the farms into fields. And on the average, there are about uh, six fields to every farm. Now, the fields vary in size. Uh, they can be upwards of about, oh, 45 acres, uh, 30 acres, 20 acres, some uh, as few as but seven acres uh, or five acres. But that's the general division, if you will, of the land. And remember, too, we're talking about land of cultivation. When I inherited Monticello and Shadwell Farm and the other farms uh, all together, I inherited over 5,000 acres from my father. And then when I married, as I have written, uh, my marriage doubled my comfort. Uh, I inherited an equal amount of acreage from my father-in-law in Bedford County. So collectively, I have held over 10,000 
uh, acres. Now, the majority of that acreage is not in cultivation. The majority of acreage is in woodlands. So I would say uh, out of the 10,000 that I inherited over time, uh, several thousand acres have been in cultivation. So that's that division of quarter farms uh, and then divided into six fields in each of those quarter farms of the acreage aforementioned. The next question. You mentioned the apple orchards earlier. One of our guests would like to know how many varieties of apples did you grow? Did you grow any peaches? And oh. did you ever use grafting for this? Grafting? I certainly do enjoy grafting. I think it's something that would lead us into more sustainable crops in the future, greater varieties of crops, particularly in our orchards. And you asked me about peaches. Mercy, that is one of my most delicious uh, of fruits. And yes, I cultivate great varieties of it. You asked me for the number of varieties of apples. Mercy, I, I would venture up to say 10, 12, perhaps more than that. And you know, I've always believed in acquiring as many seeds and as many opportunities to graft of plants that were not indigenous here, that is within Albemarle County of Virginia, uh, let alone not even on our own continent. So I've always thought the most useful service anyone can do their nation is to introduce a new plant. So <laughs> I would need to go to my farm book to know precisely counting them up how many variety of apples and how many variety of peaches uh, and apricots then. And then we go into uh, various other exotic fruits, but uh, I should hold myself to apples and peaches at present. Uh, your next question. How did you get water uh, up to the mountain here? Very, very difficult to acquire the proper amount of water in order to water all of our gardens. Uh, and I mean not only of the ornamental gardens around the mansion is, but also of vegetable gardens, a thousand feet of vegetable gardens down on the terrace. When I removed myself to Monticello, we had quite a number of springs. I would venture, oh, there were upwards of about 20, 25 springs. Now, perhaps leveling the top of the mountain off had something to do with drying up a number of those springs. So I've counted of late, and I now have 15 springs that is still not enough. Fifteen springs that are divided north side of the mountain, the south side of the mountain, west and east. Uh, so we bring water up from the Rivanna. We simply have many of uh, the enslaved bring up pails of water and barrels of water that we can use. And then, of course, of late, I found it necessary to build cisterns. And uh, we've got a good four cisterns here out from the house uh, both the uh, north uh, terraced walkway and the east terraced walkway. And we have pumps now affixed to that so we can pump the water more, more readily. Although, lamentably, they've begun to leak. I have to figure out some method of repairing that. Your next question. Enslaved people are central to the running of the Monticello plantation. Can you tell us about your systems of organizing and managing the enslaved people who do the manual labor on the plantation? Yes, that's a very good question. That's an essential question. That's a, a, a question of the of foundation, if you will, of the success of, of our agriculture. Enslaved labor. We're all in this together. We have been for many, many generations. Uh, it's been inherited. I come back to that word, inherited. We've inherited ourselves one generation after the next, to the extent now that here at my mansion house farm alone, uh, there are upwards of about, uh, oh, I would venture 140 enslaved in various capacities uh, of activity. And remember, that's only the mansion house, Monticello. Uh, that does not include Tufton, where there is many, and, and Shadwell, uh, less so, but still at Shadwell, and Lego, and Pantops. And, um, of course, the entire mountain here at Monticello, let alone at Tufton and, and Shadwell, uh, is dotted with the uh, enslaved cabins. So their division of work is essential for the sustaining of the whole, of all of us. We, we could not survive. All of us could not survive uh, without this attention. So as far as the household, of course, I have uh, the valet or my butler, that's Mr. Colbert, Burl Colbert, and, and at meals, of course, uh, where he is wanting to provide the meals at the table, he is supported with at least two servers. Uh, we have um, 
uh, uh, chamber attendants as well, who attend not only to myself, uh, but to uh, my daughter, Mrs. Randolph, and her family, all of her children, her husband, accordingly. Um, Sally Hemings attends uh, to the proper maintenance uh, of the bedchamber and my suite of rooms there. And um, then, of course, we move outside of the household and all of the attendants in the kitchens uh, at the south uh, east side of the house. Uh, and then we go down along Mulberry Row. And, of course, right there we have the, the stables that are attended to by James Gillette. Uh, he attends there with several uh, of our, our drivers who drive the carriages. I just recently uh, had um, made here on the plantation a lovely Lando. Uh, that is a very elegant uh, carriage, the finest carriage that I've ever owned uh, that was created here right at the plantation. And that included uh, work done by our blacksmith, Joseph Fawcett and work done by our joiner, Mr. John Hemmings. Uh, and then, of course, there's the Weaver's Cottage and the many Reavers that are attended there, Critter and the others that engage the work. And they are supporting amongst themselves uh, by the younger folk, let alone the older. You will go down, uh, if you will, to the, um, uh, to the brewery. Uh, the brewery is overtained by Mr. P uh, overseen by Mr. Peter Hemmings. And there are several there that are helping in the brewing, if you will, uh, of beer at, at Monticello. If you were to proceed down along the hillside, uh, say down to the Rivanna and across, if you will, to, to Shadwell Farm, uh, you will see many who are attendant to, uh, well, uh, our sawmills where that is done. Uh, you would see many attendant to the fields. And... When you are, and to the pastures, I cannot uh, forget that, uh, the sheep pastures, of, of course, let alone the, the oxen pastures and the horse pastures and the cow uh, pastures. So when you are looking at the division of labor uh, of the more than 140 souls who are attending to the cultivation of Monticello alone, you're looking at a tripartite division of labor. Uh, you look at the very young those who are 10 years and younger. Well, they're attended, of course, to the older people. They, they are becoming apprentices and are becoming learned in their particular uh, uh, attentions that they will endeavor later on. Uh, between uh, the 10 and the much older, you have uh, the more robust and the more um, healthy uh, of both men and women who are attending to the fields, let alone uh, the aforementioned crafts and, and artistry that must be endeavored here. And the men and the women work together in those fields. And then the older, those who are much older, both men and women, well, the men usually attend, if you will, to, to the gardens and the raising of vegetables, and the, the women will attend more to um, cloth making and, and the spinning uh, in kind. And, of course, oversee the rearing and the bringing up of the very young children. So that is essentially the division of labor. And of course, as has been customary, uh, this labor engages six days a week and on the average, 14 hours a day. Now, every day, of course, of labor, there is, uh, is a break uh, in the midday, particularly necessary even longer uh, during the summertime. But again, that has been the, the inheritance for several generations. Um, I cannot make an excuse for the, the proper division of this labor as I have inherited myself and have tried to make more amenable and more productive. Uh, I myself labor about that amount of time. I, the sun has never caught me in bed. I'm up before the sun and I attend just as you saw uh, to the farm book, what information I have received. I take the temperature at least twice a day uh, I take the amount of rainfall um, and I take the direction of the, of the winds. And I think that conclusively too in the work that I do and writing about my native woods and fields uh, occupies me, let alone with all of the letters I write, all of the visitors that come here. I mean, we're hardly ever alone. It's almost as if this is a, a city unto itself. Uh, we hope a sustaining city unto itself that we are at cons constantly, consistently, day after day. And uh, I usually try to get to bed early enough.
to bed early and to rise early. Well, I would hope it would keep me at least healthy. The next question. Cynthia would like to know more about the moored moldboard plow. Oh, well, thank you. That's my own particular creation. I would not call it so much uh, my special design. It is an invention from the Latin word invent veni, V-E-N-I, to come into, to bring into an area something never seen there before. I had seen plows likened unto it uh, during my, my travels throughout the kingdoms of Europe, particularly when I was sailing down the Rhine. Uh, I have seen plows likened unto it engaged by the industrious Dutch, uh, there particularly through Lancaster County in Pennsylvania. So the moldboard plow of least resistance, which is its proper uh, name, is different from what we consider an English plow in its moldboard. To best explain that, an e English plow simply has the blade almost direct at a 90 degree angle, and then the moldboard behind it perpendicular at a 90 degree angle. Well, that can be somewhat cumbersome, surely cumbersome as you're plowing through soil. But a mold board of least resistance begins with the blade cut similar at an angle of least resistance and then the mold board to be rounded so that as you're cutting through the saw, the saw rolls up over the blade and rolls over the mold board uh, to the side. So yes, that's my particular invention and creation in these parts, uh, though I never sought to have it patented. Pardon, I presided over the patent department for several years when I was Secretary of State, but no, I never patented a, a single one of my um, uh, inventions or creations. Your next question. Did you, over the past 50 years, have you seen any more uh, improvements similar to the mold board to farming? Well, I would like to consider that the threshing machine that, uh, that I procured for the threshing mill and uh, by the way, as I've talked about the various buildings and the divisions of labor, uh, I have failed to mention that as you make your way down to the Rivanna and, and proceed down river, you, you will pass, of course, my mills. I have two mills uh, there for the threshing of, of wheat and, and oats, so, uh, or for the grinding of wheat and oats, but I have a threshing house. So we have a, a, an innovative threshing machine. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, in the Weaver and Spinner's Cottage, we have a very innovative uh, loom there uh, with uh, a good 12 spindles. And um, I would like to think that the building of the cisterns that I mentioned earlier has been a successful innovation, if I can only seal many of those leaks that are attendant to it. And uh, well, I'm proud of the Landau. I mentioned my carriage earlier. Uh, it's a very elegant carriage. At least I think so. Many of my neighbors and friends within the community uh, think it is rather odd looking, but that's their opinion. Uh, everyone that I know who's seated in it is rather comfortable. So um, I would consider that. Now, um, uh, I'm hopeful that there may be further improvements that we can engage. I hope someday that I can be successful in the cultivation of wine. I have always considered the introduction of the foreign vines here to our nation could be of uh, great use and, and benefit to us. Um, no nation is drunken where wine is readily available, nor is one sober where wine is dear. But unfortunately, that has been a failure. Um, I had hoped, if you will, when I was traveling with Mr. Madison uh, up through the northern lakes and discovering um, the sugar maple trees, uh, that the sugar maple might be a benefit to our immediate neighborhood and here to Monticello. So um, a few years later, I procured uh, many uh, sugar maple trees and I planted them. Uh, planted them right here along the uh, southeast side of the mountain and stretching a bit to the west and somewhat shy of the northwest. Uh, but lamentably, they have not produced uh, the sap that is necessary. And I had hoped with the cultivation of uh, the sugar maple that we would no longer have to depend upon um, enslaved able to an extent to provide uh, sugar uh, for our, our farms here. But it's failed. I can't help but think that if there is the failure of one crop, well, then it is um, restored by the success uh, of another. 
And so I'm hopeful, though there are occasions where the wheat crops have not been readily able to, to sell, that the further cultivation of wheat will ultimately prove beneficial uh, to Monticello. Your next question. Another guest, Natalie, has some further questions about the division of labor. Did you have a foreman for each farm? Natalie, I, I refer to them as overseers. Um, foreman, uh, I think, is something that might be rather termed for northern industry uh, and, and production of machinery. But uh, overseers, yes, all of the quarter farms aforementioned uh, had their overseers. Uh, some who have been most beneficial, I cannot deny, Mr. Edmund Bacon uh, has been with us now for some years. Uh, he lives uh, just down the, the east side of the mountain on the way to Shadwell Farm. I pass by him often when I'm going down to cross the, the Rivanna River. So he oversees the cultivation of Monticello in its uh, six fields in particular and some other fields. Uh, then, of course, great George Granger, uh, uh, who has been inherited uh, through my family. Uh, he presided at Overseer at Tufton uh, for a time. Uh, they have both aforementioned been quite uh, successful and received my um, great acclamation. However, there have been some that I'm sorry to say have not been uh, so successful, and I was more than happy to leave. See, leave. Um, one Mr. Lilly I will not even begin on in that referral. Uh, other questions? What do you see as the role of farms and farming in our nation's economy? Oh, in my opinion, in my opinion, uh, there are two great vocations uh, throughout the history of mankind. Uh, one is the cultivation of the soil, and the other is the cultivation of the mind. I think the further cultivation of the mind, uh, uh, turning to the more efficient and beneficial methods of the cultivation of the soil, cannot help but serve humanity across the globe, serve the family of man no matter where it is. I was most fortunate during my time in France to become acquainted with the physiocrats. That is how they became known. Gentlemen such as Tourjot and Condorcet uh, and Pierre Samuel Dupont. These are gentlemen who are devoted to studying, if you will, the science of horticulture, the science uh, of husbandry, that is farming, in order to make it the more efficient and beneficial. You know, a people who tend to the cultivation of the soil, in my opinion, are God's chosen people because they, they provide immediately for their sustenance, the sustenance of their family, the sustenance of their neighborhood, the sustenance of the nation. They learn more distinctly holding the reins of self-government in providing directly for themselves. I would be cautious if someday we are, want to remove ourselves to the urban markets and thereby have to become dependent upon others for our sustenance. So I truly believe that continuing to root ourselves in agriculture, uh, to make it uh, the more improved, uh, to make it the more scientifically vi viable for the greater sustaining of our population, and without a question, with no further need for the enslavement of individuals, that our nation will benefit. I hope I've emphasized that our sustenance, our sustaining of ourselves here at Monticello depends upon everyone. Uh, we are sustaining ourselves in this cultivation for ourselves. Uh, and I'm happy to say that the, the enslaved themselves in their cultivation provide not only for themselves, but for selling, if you will, some of their vegetables and some of the crops that they cultivate. Um, and this needs to be extended further so that we can rid ourselves of this barbarous commerce uh, in mankind. Another question? You often were away from the plantation serving in public office. What sort of things did you miss about being here at Monticello? Well, I will tell you that I simply missed what I have been speaking of earlier, and that is my native woods and fields missing the opportunity to seek further methods of improving, improvement uh, in farming. In fact, while I was gone, uh, all essential con uh, con cultivation ceased. It just ended. I was not here. Uh, those who were here upon Monticello Farm and the other farms, they cultivated solely uh, amongst and for themselves. So I missed that opportunity uh, to engage, if you will, directly 
uh, with the sustaining element of human life, the cultivation of the soil, and I'm delighted to be able to return to it. Though you found me attended to my farm book, I must lament to inform you that perhaps over the last five years since 18 and 15, I have not been as attentive to success in the cultivation as I, I've wanted to. I, I've fallen vastly in arrears in, in the productivity, not only of Monticello farms, but my other farms. I continue the cultivation of, of tobacco at Poplar Forest, my inheritance from Mr. Wales, my father-in-law. Uh, but I'm hopeful that I can rid myself of that cultivation soon and turn it to wheat as I have been able to do here at Monticello. But you see, these are thoughts, these are aspirations, these are hopes that I lament to say I may not live to see fulfilled. And I may not even live to see the end of this barbarous commerce of slavery I mentioned. And I beg your pardon again, this is no excuse. But I will continue to hope that uh, our nation will grow the more bountiful, particularly as we settle westward, uh, for the common good. And that is why I'm, I'm happy to continue in this venture, even though it might seem similar to the pursuits of Don Quixote. <laughs> oh, mercy. But that is hope, is it not? And that is what uh, a free people should ever endeavor to aspire to. Do you have another question as well? Well, there's one last question. Could you elaborate a little bit more on what you hope will continue to be the guiding principles for the future preservation of farming and a respect for nature through generations to come? Sustaining farming means sustaining nature. Very simply, from time immemorial, it's common sense. Wherever you reap, you must sow. We simply cannot continue to lumber across the country and, and to reap the bounty that our Creator has provided us and not replenish it ourselves. It's up to us. Uh, God's work on earth must truly be our own, as the Quakers are wont to say. And so I believe that that is the necessity uh, to keep our land, to keep our precious gift here of North America as a people, as the American people, to keep it sustained one generation after the next, to make it the more improved, to make it the more beneficial for each and every soul that uh, we can live up to that promise. That promise, if you will, and if I say so, who shouldn't, that General Washington called our Declaration of American Independence. Well, I, I thank you all for this time that we could all be together again. And I've just been thinking of something else that I should add to my farm book. So as I endeavor to engage it, uh, I endeavor also to invite you to return. And um, rest assured, whenever you come to visit uh, here at El Monticello and uh, are intrigued to pursue, if you will, a curiosity through uh, our fields and uh, in the orchards and in the gardens and simply the flowers here, I also encourage you to visit with our families. And I mean not only the Jeffersons. Please visit with the Fawcett's and the Grangers and the Colbert's and the Evans and the Hemings. And uh, rest assured, pay your respects to our family cemeteries. That's why they're along the road to remind us uh, in our life's journeys of those who have gone before, uh, that we have much to learn from them. And that is why we endeavor to continue to memorialize them. That is one reason why I have entered so many names in the farm book, so many that I have known, so that we will not forget. I remain your humble and obedient servant, Thomas Jefferson. Godspeed.